have a look through all of tomorrow morning's newspapers at midnight uh, this evening. Vince Graff and Wayne Curry with us tonight to do that. They'll battle it out after midnight. Before that, Sean Atwood became a stock market millionaire in the dot-com bubble in the early 90s. And he's our 11.30 one-on-one interview tonight. He was leading a double life. He was throwing raves, distributing ecstasy. And on the 16th of May 2002, a SWAT team smashed down his door. I've been speaking to Sean. Let me warn you now, some of the violence he describes is very graphic. He told me how his life unravelled when the police came to his door. I went to America as a young person. I made a million in the stock market and the money went to my head. And I started to transfer the Manchester rave scene to Phoenix, Arizona. I didn't see the law as an obstacle to our, our partying, so we had people bringing hits of ecstasy in. So I take full responsibility for the SWAT team coming and smashing my door down. So you were doing ecstasy, uh, having made big money, you, you got involved in drugs, and then one day your million-dollar house, was the door was battered in. Yes, um, I just closed out a stock market trade on my computer. There was a knock at the door. Bang, 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 bang. Tempe Police Department, we have a warrant, open the door. So I jump up, look through the peephole, it's blacked out. I run to the bedroom to get my girlfriend. We're thinking, what should we do? We get halfway through the living room and just boom! Door leaps off its hinges. They just come filing in the SWAT team, full battle gear. Hands above your heads, don't move! Get on the ground now! I've never been so scared in my life when they just fanned out and just all these fully automatic weapons are pointing at me. What had you been doing? What I've been doing, well, over the years, I've been throwing rave parties in Arizona, and I had people bringing ecstasy in and selling it. So, like I said, I, you know, I broke all these drug laws. America was good to me. Why? Uh, and and I, I why though? <laughs> why risk it when you had the money made anyway? I know. I, I, I asked myself this over and over again. I was getting a lot of attention. You know, I, I started throwing these parties, and I'm selling the ecstasy, and people come up to me all night, thanking me for the party, thanking me for the ecstasy, and I'm only in my twenties. And it just went to my head. It, it became like an addiction, um, just getting all this attention. <laughs> and, and you were doing big drugs, big amounts of it, selling yeah, a lot of it? Um, thousands of pills, yeah, over the years. Crazy, Sean. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. And the realisation then literally comes to your door when you heard that yes. bang. I had to pay the price for committing all these crimes over the years. Police swarmed uh, in. What did they do? Just yelling at us to get on the ground and, you know, me and my girlfriend drop and they crush us with elbows, knees, boots, um, cuff us and then they just hoist me up like a puppet and the detective says, you know, you're a big name from the rave scene and we're sure this raid is going to justify the charges. What was going through your mind? I was just scared I was going to get shot when all, I've never seen... So many guns, all these, you know, just pointing at me, all these fully automatic weapons. And I'm thinking, if one of these guys is trigger happy, my life is over in seconds right now. I'm just going to get riddled with bullets. What do they do next? Next, I am hauled off to Sheriff Joe Arpaio's jail system, which is the jail in America that's got the highest rate of death out of all of them. And you're there on remand for 26 months? Yeah, all my money and assets were seized, and I never got any back, and my bail was set at $750,000 cash only, so there was no way I was getting out of the jail. I, I end up on remand for 26 months. What was it like in there? Well, when you first go in, um, you've got to get used to the sound of heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies getting thrown around, people getting out, carried out on stretchers. It's completely gang-controlled, and because I'm white... As soon as I went in, the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang came up to me and first thing they do is ask you what your charges are. Now, you can't lie about your charges because it's on a little printout from the jail. Some charges are K-O-S by the gang, which means kill on sight, such as paedophile stuff. Other charges are SOS, which means smash on sight. If you've got a sex offence or a crime against a woman or a child... As soon as you go in, the gang is going to try and murder you. At the very least, they're going to smash you. It's, it's called convict justice. Once you get through that interrogation, then you have to go to the meeting and meet what's called the head of the race. He explains all the rules you must follow or else the whole gang will smash you. If someone calls you a punk, a bitch, or hits you, you must fight them on the spot or else the gang will smash you. You must take showers or else they'll smash you having bad hygiene. Can't go making friends with the guards or else they'll smash you for snitching. Can't go sitting at the tables with the other race or else they'll smash you for that. 
everything you take for granted about your safety in society is reversed in jail. They're constantly looking for people to beat up because that's how they earn their reputations and their tattoos. It's called putting work in to earn your political ink. And the most serious the act of violence, higher up in the gang are the tattoos that they earn. To be a full member of the Aryan Brotherhood, to be patched in and get the Warbird tattoo, you have to murder someone in the jail for them. And I've got, I've actually got videos showing Aryan Brotherhood gang members murdering prisoners and guards murdering so prisoners. The, so the head of this gang sat down and, and read all these rules to you? Yeah, you get interrogated about your charges, and then you have to go and have a meeting with the head of the race, and he explains how it works in there. Because if you're someone like me, you know, you're just completely clueless. It's a completely different world. You're in a state of shock. Everything you're thinking about in your everyday life, what you're going to have for dinner, who's going to text you, or you know, what you're going to do, what you're going to do, this, it's all out the window. It just boils down to raw survival. How old um, were you when you walked in those doors? 33. You must have been terrified. You get a look of shock on your face, and the, the older cons, they come up to you and they say you've got to get that look of shock off you, or else you're going to get preyed on. But over time, what happens is, you get this thing called dead eyes, it's a completely expression, you know, you're devoid of emotion, your, your face is completely expressionless. And on my driver's license photo today, because people come up to me at book signings and stuff and say, you know, you look happy and healthy, how could you have gone through this? And I just show them my driver's license picture and I've got this dead eyes look, because you just see so much violence in there, you become immune to it. You were moved into a, a cell with a serial torture, it says here. Oh my goodness, yeah. After I was sentenced, after 26 months, I get sent to a medium security prison and I get moved in with this guy who was a serial home invader, torturer. He was breaking into people's houses and his preferred method of torture was to take a hammer to the kneecaps. Now his welcoming statement to me the night I move in with him, I've got a padlock in a sock, I can smash your brains in while you sleep, I can kill you whenever I want. Really nice guy. Now, he and at this stage, of course, Sean, you 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 you'd just received the sentence of nine and a half years. Yes. So so you knew you were in this for the long haul, and yes. this jail you're moved to, this guy's threatening you in night one to kill you. Yes, the guards played a joke on me. They said this guy's a bit of a joker, and we're going to put you in with him. But it ended up with the joke was on me because he was very sneaky. He, the two things you look forward to the most in prison are your visits and your mail. And he knew my family were flying to see me for Christmas. So he had his mate, a 20 stone California biker, attack me just when I'm walking to the visit with my parents. And this guy comes up behind me, you know, starts kidney punching me. All the prisoners stopped to see my reaction because, like I said, the gang rule is you must hit back or else you're considered a punk and everyone preys on you. But if you do hit back and the guards see it, you're arrested and sent to a prison within the prison called Lockdown or the Hall, and you lose all your privileges, including your visits. My parents have just come 5,000 miles and paid all this money, so I had to think fast on my feet. I spun around, I started throwing some kicks and punches, but it was no good. It was like hitting a big bag of cement. And he was a kickboxer. He spun me around, smashed my back up real good. A guard, someone warned that a guard was coming, so I was able to, to leg it off to the visit before it got much worse. But I was all injured, you know. Um, I'm not a tough guy, I'm just a skinny, nerdy-looking business graduate, you know, so I didn't, didn't have much chance with this fellow. My mum and dad are asking me at the visit what's wrong with me because they can see I'm all injured. And I, I can't tell my mum because she had a nervous breakdown. When I got back from the visit, the big guy's got a young person dangling by the neck from a second-story balcony. And my cellmate is getting higher and higher on heroin. And this is the worst part of the whole thing. This and the cockroaches is the worst part for me right now. My cellmate, he's, he's keeping me up all night, interrogating me. He's showing me the padlock in the sock. He's going to smash my head in with while I'm asleep. And I get so scared. And I'm not, you know, I've never I tried to get outside help before. I get so scared. I call my family and say, look, you've got to put a call into the British Embassy and try and get me moved out of this cell because I think this guy's going to kill me. I've never asked for any help before. They've got to con if, see if they can call here and ask the deputy warden if they can get moved, but they've got to do it in a way so this guy doesn't get in any trouble because if he gets in trouble, I'm a snitch. All the prisoners are going to want to kill me. Fortunately, the British Embassy ha ha handled it diplomatically. I was moved and he's throwing batteries at me for a few weeks afterwards until I got a cellmate who was bigger than him. 
And then he had words and it all stopped after that. You, you say that you're threatened by these people, that if you don't fight back, yeah. um, that you'll be considered a punk and they'll prey on you. What, yeah. what, what does that mean, prey on you? What do they do? Um, it just opens you up to getting raped, getting robbed, just getting brutalised. You know, it's, it, you can't show any sign of weakness at all in the people are starving hungry and going through the trash for food but and they're going door to door begging you for food as well for commissary if you've got commissary you start giving people stuff you, you have a whole line of them at your door in no time and people trying to bully your food out of you it's just this environment where it's, it's raw survival of the fittest and did you see other people being picked upon oh yeah I, I mean one of the first ones in my book i saw this guy in the shower and he got smashed by the white gang it was a white guy and the gang leave the shower, and this big white guy, he's got cobwebs tattooed on his neck. He says to the head of the gang, he says, how come we can still hear him? He's like, oh, we smashed him good. He's like, not good enough. And he goes in the shower, and it's like he's trying to break this guy's head open like it's a coconut, just crack, crack, crack. Now, he, he does this until the guy looks dead, and I've never seen violence at this level before. The body's just on the floor until the guard does a security walk ten minutes later. He goes, lock down, everybody, lock down. So we all had to run back to our cells. I put my face to the plexiglass window because I want to see what the damage is. And I'll never forget it. I still have nightmares about this stuff. The guy's on a stretcher. And not only is the blood coming out of his head, there's yellow fluid, like brain stuff. Where were the guards? The guards, all right, to keep the costs down... This is why the British public is being softened up for US-style justice right now. The private prisons get $50,000 a year per prisoner of taxpayers' money. So to keep the costs down, to maximise their profits, they have two guards watching hundreds of inmates. And it can't, they can't possibly watch them all effectively. So it's, that's why it's completely gang-controlled. And did you come close to being assaulted? Were you ever assaulted? Yeah, do you know what, what, like at the level I was, I just described to you, I never got any bones broken, I never got any teeth knocked out. Out of the over 100 people who arrested with me were some of my bouncers from the rave scene, including a massive best friend of mine from my hometown called Wildman. He was in the same jail as me for the first year or so, so he looked out for me. Later on, I started writing stories for the prisoners and putting them on the internet, and they started to protect me. And one of the guys whose story I was writing was an Irish-Italian mafia mass murderer called Two Tonys. He left dead bodies from Tucson to Alaska, but he claimed they all had it coming because they were rival gangsters. So he didn't see anything wrong with that. Now, if you've murdered gangsters, you're at the top of the respect order on the yard, versus if you've murdered a woman or a child and you're at the bottom, those guys, that you know, they, they try and murder those guys as soon as they come in. So I did have problems with the Orion Brotherhood prison gang, and two Tonys m made the problems go away from me. Because if I had got beat up, I wouldn't have been able to keep writing his story. It just sounds like hell. It is, but like I said, you know, I committed all these crimes over the years, so I des fully deserve to be punished. And it's actually strengthened me and sent my life in this whole new positive direction. Because I go into schools now, I'm doing over 100 talks a year, speaking to tens of thousands of students to put them off getting involved in drugs and crime. And I get emails every day, f day from the kids just saying, you know, we don't listen to our teachers. But because your story's true, it's, it's gripped us and it, it showed us what drugs and crime can lead to. What are the long-lasting effects of that on, on you, what you experienced in jail? Well, I had psychotherapy while I was in there, and they told me, the psychotherapist told me to try and continue it when I got out. So when I got to my hometown of Witness, I asked them if I could get psychotherapy, and they said there was a two-year waiting list. So what I've done is I've just gone into my own um, healing processes by using yoga, and meditation and fitness classes I've got this manic energy and that was what was leading to me getting in trouble and the psychotherapist taught me he said you know you were channeling that energy into all these negative addictions I still hear the wolves howling for me to come out and party especially when I hear, like I hear an old school rave tune but I remember what he said now I'll go to the fitness center do karate do body combat and just come out on natural high it's, it's all about channeling that energy you talked, Sean, about the, the cockroaches earlier on. You, you described them as one of the worst things in there. Yeah, it, I had a nervous breakdown. When I got moved into maximum security, lockdown is 8 at night, 10 o'clock is lights out. It's like the cockroaches knew 
just when the lights were about to go out, you would see them, they would start lining up in the cracks in the walls, doing a little movement with their antennae sticking out. And as soon as the lights went out, they just flooded the room. And they had a choice. You could wrap a sheet around you, so you look like the mummy and you, you could leave a breathing hole but it would trap the heat to your body and because it's so hot out there and there's no proper air conditioning you've got these bleeding and itching skin infections and bed sores so the sheet traps the heat to your body and it aggravates that condition so you end up just throwing it off you and letting the, the roaches crawl on you they don't bite they tickle your feet your limbs the palms of your hands they try and get in your ears to eat your earwax it's like honey to them I had a neighbour who was asthmatic in maximum security. He woke up one morning, out of breath, grabbed his inhaler, took a blast, and there was a cockroach in it, and he, he shot it right inside himself. And you'd feel these things crawling all over you? You just had to submit to them, yeah. Like at night time, you would wrap the sheet around you, and you would just get so hot and itchy because you've got these skin infections and bed sores and you can see the cockroaches swirling around on the wall just inches away from your face and as soon as you took that sheet off you because you wanted to get to sleep you, they would start coming up at the ends of the bunk and the first thing they do was tickle your feet and get on your legs I'll never forget it When did you take your nervous breakdown? What happens was I couldn't sleep and I started to see imaginary cockroaches and I started to hear voices and it was like I was going insane and they had to start giving me uh, a drug so I could get to sleep in there. But it was through yoga and meditation over time I got off that drug and, you know, I believe in a holistic approach now. When you walked out the door having been released, what was it, six years oh. later? Yeah, yeah. What did it feel like? Oh, it was amazing. Um, I've been in transportation for days so I had no sleep, and, but I'm just high on this adrenaline, you know. We got to the plane, landed in London, and my mum's there, my sister, they're crying, and my dad's there. And first thing they did was we went to an Indian food restaurant. But to this day, I don't eat nowhere near as much food as I did prior to my rest, because I, I realise you just don't even need that much food. And to this day, I'm a vegetarian because the food in the jail, it was a, it was a mystery meat slop called Red Death. It looked like carroty vomit blended with blood. It had all this random meat in it and it stung. Sometimes there was dead rats in it. On one occasion I gave a dead rat back to the guards and, and we, you know, we complained. And they said they would investigate it and they, they came back later in the day and, and so the jail wouldn't get any trouble. They said it was just a potato. So that day I was released. I, I ordered chicken tikka masala. Um, after being vegetarian for years, I got the gag reflex. So I, you know, I've stayed vegetarian. I did a few BBC interviews, and it, it's because a, a Harley Street drug counsellor heard one of those. He contacted the BBC, and he said, I want to hire Sean to go in the schools and do these talks. So that was... Like, so I've got a criminal record now, so that was... He was this great guy that helped me get a job and, and helped me send my life in this new positive direction, influencing young people. And is that where you're at now? You, you, you've got yourself together again? Yeah, that's where I'm at now. I just go all over the country doing these talks. And if I'm not doing talks, I'm writing. My first book, Hard Time, was published almost two years ago now. My next book, Party Time, is coming out in spring. Is life good? It is, you know. After going through all this, I wake up every day with a smile on my face. I'm, there's no cockroaches on the walls. You know, there's no dead rats in the food. You know, we're in the West. We've got it so good. And I see people, like, stuck in traffic, giving themselves heart attacks because they can't get somewhere on time. And I'm automatically thinking, if this person had been in a life-and-death environment, this wouldn't even be registering. So, again, the jail experience did me a whole lot of good. It's changed my moral system, and it's given me a whole new appreciation of life. It's an incredible story, Sean. Thank you for sharing just even a little of it uh, with us tonight. Thank you, sir. Oh, thanks very much, Stephen, for having me on the show. Cheers. The book is called Hard Time, a Brit in America's Toughest Jail by Sean Atwood. An extraordinary story, uh, I reckon. Two and a half minutes now uh, to midnight.